I uh, I don't know if you guys uh, I, I I had a good time this past week. I just really enjoyed being with my family, and uh, it was a, it was just a joy to be able to to uh, spend time and uh, and see some see folks and and everything. I hope you did too. And but uh, you know when when you come back from that, man, it's also a joy to see your church family. And uh, just walking in the room today and seeing some of you, some of you, you've been traveling for a couple weeks, and it's just good to be able to see your face today, and uh, and and just let you know that I love you. And uh, but uh, so good to have you here today. Excited about what God has in store for us um, today. We begin a new series, and uh, we're calling this series the Greatest Gift. And uh, and and so over the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about this next week. I'm going to be sharing a message with you entitled, Share Your Greatest Gift. And, and, and your greatest gift is that of salvation. How many believe that salvation is probably the greatest gift that we've ever received? And so next week, we're going to be talking about evangelism. And each one of you, before you leave next Sunday, is going to receive a gospel presentation for you to go share with someone this Christmas season. I want to tell you something. We go and we shop and we spend money and we hit the Black Friday sales and the Mars Cyber Monday, and we go and we, we spend lots and lots of dollars trying to, uh, to buy gifts for people that, honestly, we don't even remember what we bought them last year, and we buy them the same thing, don't we, sometimes? How many of you got the same gift every year, uh, two years in a row? I mean, you know, or, or, you know, you don't realize that sometimes, and we, we'll spend all that money. But I want to tell you something, the greatest gift that we could ever give someone is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we want to be able to put that tool in your hand next week and, and encourage you to make this season a season of focusing on Jesus and, and, and sharing the greatest gift with others. And then we'll have our Christmas program. And then the last Sunday of, of our Christmas series, I'll be preaching a message on receiving your greatest gift. And I want to encourage you to do something for me. If you can invite someone to be here, you can invite a friend to be here. They're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ that Sunday. Clear. Because it's about receiving the greatest gift that we've ever, ever had. I, we, many of you in here have that testimony. You received Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. And we want to encourage more to be here so that they can hear that same message. The message, the true message of the manger, which is the receiving of the greatest gift ever given. The gift of Jesus now, when you think back across your life, I ask you something, what was the greatest gift that you ever received? Think about that just for a moment. I remember some special gifts that I was given in my life. Um, uh, I remember a Christmas day uh, back when I was, uh, I think, 11 or 12 years old. My dad, my parents were separated, and my dad showed up that, that, that Christmas day and uh, got permission from my mother, and we left that afternoon and drove to Canton, Ohio, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. I want to tell you something. That was a thrill of this young boy's heart. I mean, I had a great. I, had, I was a big old Redskin fan, and my mom had hand knit a Redskin sweater. How many? Have, and anybody had a hand knit sweater uh, back when you were? I mean, a hand knit uh, Redskin sweater uh, back in the day. And 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 so we went there and had a blast. Got snowed in in West Virginia on the way back. And man, it was a wonderful time. But that was a great gift. Man, I've received a lot of great gifts through the, through, through the ages and, and different things like that. I hope that uh, possibly I've even given um, great gifts. Uh, maybe you're, in your mind you had a great gift that you gave away. Maybe it's like, I mean, it was in your mind it was a great gift. I mean, it's like, man, I really, man, I, you know, sometimes, have you ever given a gift where you just pat yourself on the back like, man, I did good on that one. You know, I mean, sometimes we might do that. Given that greatest gift. Now, I want to ask you another question, though. What's the worst gift you were ever given? Anybody ever been given a gift you're like, is this a dirty Santa party? <laughs> you know, and, and you're wondering what's going on here, you know, and you're wondering where that gift's coming from. How many of you ever re-gifted something? Come on. Be honest. If you've re-gifted something, raise your hand. I'm so grateful that somebody in here was honest about re-gifting. Let me tell you about re-gifting for a minute. In Webster's Dictionary, re-gift is listed as both a noun and a verb. Um, it's both an object and an action. 
It means this, something given as a gift that the giver has previously received as a gift from someone else. Today, I want us to think a little differently. I want us to think a little differently. What is there in your life? I'm going to adjust my mic there. It wasn't on my, on my mouth there. What is there in your life that God has given you that you could re-gift? That you could give away? What blessing has God given you that you could use to bless someone else? To do that, to, to do for someone else. So today I want to preach on this subject. Giving away your greatest gift. Giving away your greatest gift. Luke chapter 2, would you please stand in the honor of reading of God's word. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard. If you have the U version uh, and you're able to access it on your phone, uh, you can follow along there as well. Uh, now in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that his census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone was on his way to register for census to... Uh, to each to his own city. I want you to take note of that, that everyone was headed to their own city. That means this, there was a lot of people there. A lot of, there was a big crowd arriving. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and fam family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And we know that this child was the son of the living God, Jesus of Nazareth. Man, isn't that wonderful to know? God, think about this just for a minute before we sit down. God stepped out of heaven and stepped into humanity in that moment. Man, what a wonderful, wonderful day that was to see God was now touchable. Man, that's good to know, isn't it? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, we just come to you now in the name of Jesus. God, in these moments, God, we need you to speak. God, I need you to speak even above my voice. God, would you speak to our hearts, our souls, our minds, and help us, Lord, to, to live a life that is generous and giving like you are. You gave us your son. Father, thank you, Lord, for doing that. God, have your way in this time, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. I want to ask you another question. Uh, 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 this is, how many of you would say that, for the most part, you're pretty blessed? I mean, it would say for the most part, every hand in this room ought to go up. If you're living in the United States of America, you're blessed. Uh, you really are. And we're the most free country in the world. We have, more, we have access to more goods and services than any country in the world. Well, I mean, we've got a lot going on here. And uh, we are blessed to be here. Um, we can measure blessing by a lot of standards, though. Some of you may not think you're as blessed as others or whatever. Some have been blessed with an abundance of things. You know, uh, garages aren't used for cars anymore, are they? <laughs> uh, you know, they are used to, stock, to, to stack up our toys. The old, te the old statement used to be, he who dies with the most toys wins. You know, now I'm here to tell you that he who dies with the most toys still dies. But that happens. Some have been blessed with a great job and income. People talk about you. They say, um, what a great success you are, because success is measured by high position, a lot of power, and a great portfolio. Some have been blessed with great talent. They get pats on the back for singing, acting, performing, or whatever else people hold up high. They are famous because they have talent. In some circles, they may even be called an American Idol. There are lots of standards that we could use to measure blessing. Most of us in this room could say, without a doubt, 
we have been given more than what we deserve. How many agree with that? I've been given far more than what I deserve. Today, as we look at this passage in Luke 2, blessings abound. And the greatest blessing of all was about to come into this world. Think about it. The birth of Jesus, the Son of God, was about to take place. We read here in verse 7. Take a look here again at verse 7 of Luke chapter 2. It says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Today, as we are thinking about giving away our greatest gift, I want us to consider a couple of things. One is, I want you to, first one is this, give what you have. Give what you have. God's blessed you. Now, I'll tell you something. Listen, God's blessed you. God's blessed some, like we said earlier, God's blessed some with more than others. But give what you have. You know, I'm going to challenge you to do something. We're going to, uh, and you'll hear some of this in this message, but I'm going to challenge you to do something. Whatever your greatest gift that you're going to give this year, would you be willing to match that and give that same greatest gift to the Lord this year? or even above? Would you be willing to do more? Would you be willing to give in such a way and be generous in such a way that God would use you in a way that you've never expected him to use you before? Give what you have. Mary and Joseph had traveled from Galilee to Nazareth and then to Bethlehem. I want you to understand something. This was around 70 miles through the mountains. They were not traveling in an SUV and they were not using Hertz rent a mule. Okay, they were walking, and that's you know that was a long way to go. I want you to know I went to um, uh, years ago. I had an opportunity to go to Guatemala on a mission trip. This was after we had uh, adopted Ben, and we got to go back again. And I was uh, teaching at a pastors' conference over in the hills of Guatemala, almost near um, near Mexico. And we got to drive there. And uh, I'm sitting there, and this one pastor walks in at the last minute. He's a little bit late getting there. But the reason why he was late getting there is that because he had gotten up at 1 o'clock in the morning and walked through the jungles of Guatemala, through the mountains, just to get there to hear me. I'm going to tell you something that's humbling. This, this is what, this, this, we're talking, this was not easy. This was not easy what, what they were doing. They were, they were having to make a long trek to get to where they had to get to. But they were doing this because they had to, but they were also doing this to fulfill prophecy. She was great with child, and she was ready to give birth. When they finally arrived in Bethlehem, labor pains are probably kicking in. You know, uh, th- uh, it's, it's, it's a, it can be an exciting time. But Joseph, I, I can imagine, I mean, maybe Joseph began to worry a little bit. You know, what, what are we going to do? I mean, the, the place is packed. I mean, remember what we said? Well, how, who all was going to their hometown? Everyone. Everybody was showing up. Everybody was there. There was lots of people coming into this town. I mean, let me ask you something, parents. Do you remember that moment when, 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 you, when you were on the way to the hospital? Getting ready. Uh, some, of, some of you, it's been recent, and some of you are, are about to experience that. Listen, I want to tell you something. If you remember that moment when you're on the way to the hospital and, and, and it's come, uh, there's a lot of emotions taking place. You know? It's not the time to go through the drive through at McDonald's. I'm just letting you know. There's a lot of nervousness taking place. There's a lot of things happening. I mean, what, think about this. Place yourself in their shoes for a moment. Think about what they're going through for a moment, what emotions they're feeling. Do you think there was, might have been a little fear? Maybe some uncertainty or possibly some excitement? I mean, there's a baby about to be born. I mean, honestly, a baby about to be born is pretty exciting. How many would agree that a baby being born is pretty exciting? I mean, we, we just had one born uh, uh, last, uh, last week, you know, and, and man, exciting times. Hope. You see, and, and see, this is a unique situation because this wasn't just hope for having 
a, a new member of the family. This was, now we have a Savior being born. We have hope for humanity taking place. I mean, I, I, I can't even imagine that what was going on in their minds and in their hearts as they're, as they're approaching Bethlehem and as they're walking in and they're, they're trying to find a place to stay. And we find out in verse 7 that Jesus is born. But we also find out it wasn't born in a hospital. He was born in what many people I've heard believe may have been a cave. Other scholars say that it may have been a little side room that someone has set aside for their animals when they bring them in from the cold of night. He was placed in a manger, a feeding trough. You ever seen one of those? Some of you are farmers. You've seen, you've put out feeding troughs for your animals. He was placed in that. Why? Why is that the case? Because there was no room for him in the end. There was no room for him. Which brings us to this innkeeper. The innkeeper. I, I, can, I, I was thinking about him as I was, as I was reading through this and, 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 and thinking about maybe the emotions that maybe he, even he was feeling. Because to be honest with you, the innkeeper gets a bad rap. I, I mean, I, I've heard lots of sermons about, man, I'll tell you, the innkeeper had no room for Jesus. Do you have room for Jesus? Have you ever heard that? I've heard that sermon preached before. I may have even preached it. I don't know. Yeah, the innkeeper... Could you imagine? I mean, here he is. He sees this young man and this, and this very obviously pregnant Mary. And he, the young man looks in and says, Sir, my wife is pregnant. Do you have room for us? How hard it might, must have been for the word no to come across that innkeeper's lips. No, I. Everybody got here before you did. I don't have any room. Because you see, he was full because what? Everybody came to town. Interesting enough, he was full because he was blessed. He was full because he had been blessed. He was blessed financially. He had been blessed that day. by had, man, I can't imagine. Do you think his inn had been full the whole year round? Probably not. But that night he was. And maybe he had been celebrating the idea of a great income. But now he's having to tell someone no. Some businesses would say, you know what? When we have to start telling people no, that's when we know we're successful. There was no room available. You know, I don't know what may have happened that night. I don't know what may have taken place. What we do know is this. There was no room for him in, the end, them in that end. But I'm grateful, and I believe they were grateful, that somebody that night gave what they had. They gave what they had. It may have even been all they had. But they gave what they had. They gave a stable filled with hay. They gave them a place, a feeding trough. Isn't it great that somebody gave the Savior what they had. He just gave them what they had. That's all. Listen, you know what? That's all you need to do is give him what you have. Uh, understand this. Everything you have, he gave to you anyway. So give him what you have because it was already his. Maybe this person said, I don't have much but I've got this spot over here with the animals. See, he used the resources he had been blessed with. He gave what he had. 
Reminds me of somebody. Reminds me of a widow. It reminds me of a widow in Mark 12, 41 through 44. We have this story about a widow that Jesus points out as an example of what it means to give from what you have. Let's read this story. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people uh, put money into the treasury. And many uh, who were rich put in much, and one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow has put more in than all those who have given to the treasury. For they all, for they all put, out, put in out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had. Her whole livelihood. She gave what she had. Are you willing to give Jesus what you have? I'm not asking you to get. We're not. Listen, I don't want you to consider giving what you don't have. Give Jesus what you do have. Trust Him with what you have. The value of what she gave was less than a penny. And she probably gave what she even had that day. But what she gave was small. God saw was big. What she gave was small. God saw was big. And Jesus saw how she gave and not what she gave. Think about that for a moment. The value of what she gave was small in, in the earthly eyes, but it was huge in God's eyes because she gave what? She had. See, I believe that that person that night gave what they had. They gave their resources. They gave what was necessary. Secondly, it's more important how we give than it is what we give. It's more important how we give than it is what we give. As Jesus observed people giving that day with the widow... He noticed how they gave. Think about how we give sometimes. How do you give your gift? How do you give gifts? Think about this. How do you give? You know, some people give out of pride. In the scriptures, Ananias and Sapphira. Do you remember that story? It's in the book of Acts. You had Ananias and Sapphira. They had had this piece of land, and, and they, want, they thought, hey, we're going to you know, we're going to sell it and, 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 and give it um, to the church. And, and they announced that they were selling it. But, you know, what did they do? They, they told everybody, we're giving the entire amount to the Lord. They, listen, they gave out of their pride. But they never gave what they really had. They gave less than what they had. But they told everybody different. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. It cost them their life. In the book of Acts. But they gave out of Pride. Some people give out of obligation. You do that right now. It's called taxes. <laughs> right? You know, render to Caesar what Caesar's. We give out of obligation. Yeah. How many of, think about this. How many of this Christmas? Some some sometimes this, you have to give because you have to give. Not that you want to buy that person a gift, but you do anyway, right? Out of obligation. Some people give out of guilt. You see a TV commercial come on and, and showing little puppy dogs limping out of cages. And they tell you if you don't give, that you're the worst person on the planet. And you begin to give out of guilt. And then some people give out of ritual. It's just what you've always done. I just give. It's more important, listen to me, how you give than what you give. Because you see, I believe that widow that day and that man that, and the person who gave up their place, they didn't give out of any of those things. They gave out of their love and their passion for the Lord. They gave out of what they had. The widow is our example. 
She didn't give out of pride, obligation, guilt, or ritual. The scripture says she gave out of her poverty. She gave out of her poverty. She gave out of her emptiness. She gave out of her nothingness. She gave out of her want. She gave more than anyone else because she gave out of her affection. Do you give out of love? You see, I, I, I buy presents for my family, and I do it with joy, and I give out of love for them. When, when we do that, and I ask you, do you give to the Lord out of love? Do you know there's such a thing as hilarious giving? Do you, do you understand what I mean? It's joyful giving. We're going to give to him generously and hilariously. You know, that we're giving, we're excited about it. And we give to him. So we offered you this, we're giving you these opportunities to give this month. And, and we give out of love and out of affection. It's more important how we give than it is what we give. Another example is the early church. The early church. Uh, in Acts 2, 42, 44 through 45, says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. You see, they exhibited their unity in their gathering. People knew that these people were the church. They were seen together and they believed together. They were identified by their love for one another. This this idea of all things in common comes from the, from the word koinonia, or fellowship, or partnership. They had all things in common. They joined, they came together. They were identified by this. They were identified by their partnership, by their togetherness, by being one in the Spirit. They were living out Jesus' words of John 13, 35. By all this, men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. They were doing that. They were characterized by their generosity. Think about this. It says here in Acts chapter 2 that they sold their stuff to meet the needs of others. They had a yard sale. You know, I want to have a church yard sale? Let's do a church yard sale. I got this. Let's do a church yard sale where we take the proceeds and just give it away. How many want to work that yard sale? I'll take Listen. A lot of times we want to do a yard sale. I, I'm doing, if I'm doing a yard sale for my stuff over there, I want the money from it. To do what with? To buy more stuff to put in the next yard sale, right? I know a church, a friend of, a, a friend of mine actually, a friend of mine in seminary, uh, uh, his, uh, one, of the, one of his strategies for planting his church in Delaware, a very unchurched area, was he did a free yard sale every year to reach lost people. I thought that was pretty neat. They were characterized by that. They, they, did not, they did it not to meet their own need, but the needs of others. They had a culture of generosity. Generosity, love, and unity are not always the words that are used to describe the modern-day church. Sometimes it's the opposite. I want you to know something, though. That's not here. Uh, I, I'm... I, but I do want to say this, but this, this happens in churches. Asking more than giving. Asking more than giving. Asking from, from everyone rather than giving. Asking more from the community than we give to the community. Closing our doors to people that are not like us. We have that happening in our culture. Division over small beliefs and differences and desiring credit over faith. In the New Testament, we find churches, though, like 2 Corinthians, in, like the church at Corinth. 2 Corinthians 8, 3, said, Paul says, I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord. They gave out of their own ability and beyond their ability. This was supernatural giving. Are you known for that? Pray you will be. Philippians chapter 4, the church at Philippi, verses 15 through 18 Paul writes and says, For you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. 
For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the, seek the gift itself, but I, but I seek for the profit which increases in your account. But I have received everything full and above and in abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you have sent, a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. You know what? I, my hope is through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering that we might get letters like that from missionaries around the world that we gave such a way that it blessed them that immensely like Paul received from the church at Philippi. When the church begins to do what the church is supposed to do, we will see a church culture of generosity. Listen to this quote. All true beliefs express themselves in tangible actions. Think about it. These churches that we're talking about here, they didn't give according to what they possessed. They gave according to what God possessed. They didn't rely on their own provision, but upon His provision. They didn't rely on their own power, but upon the power from above. They gave out of their affections. Listen to this quote. The truest test of whether or not you believe something is whether or not you are willing to live it. Are you willing to live what Jesus gave to you? Are you willing to live it out? My evangelism professor in seminary, Dr. Alvin Reed, said this. He says, the unchurched are less likely to ask you, can you prove it? They are more likely to ask you, can you live it? You know, I know we have a debating culture, but I think we would have less of a debating culture if we were living out what we say we believe. Man, are you willing to live it like that? What do you have that God has given to you that you can re-gift? Are you willing to re-gift your resources? Are you willing to re-gift what God has given you, your blessings? I, I challenge you during this month, during, these, during this season of Christmas, to give away what God has already given you. To give away what God has blessed you with. Maybe it be your finances. Maybe it be your resources. Maybe it be your, the, your, your home. Whatever it is that you have. Anything. Will you re-gift that back out to a culture that needs Christ? What blessing has God given you that you could use to bless someone else? You see, we get, we're going to provide for you this month some places to re-gift what God has given to you. Our latest ministry has started a ministry to minister to the homeless. They have several items that they're collecting. And they've done, you've done a really good job. But they want to extend that all the way into January as they're collecting these items. And they're going to be these care packages they're putting together to help touch the life of somebody who's not as blessed as we are. Yeah. We said earlier we're blessed, right? Everybody still believe you're blessed? I hope you do. Great opportunity. Great opportunity of a place for you to re-gift what God has given you. How about Toys for Tots? Toys for Tots is another thing that we are supporting here this year, and we have our, the box out in the foyer and in the, and in the fellowship hall in the FLC. We want to encourage you to buy new toys and bring them so that children, maybe some of you have gone past the, the stage of buying toy, little toys for your children. They're grown, they've grown up like mine have grown up. Uh, oh, my heart hurts some days thinking how fast. They have grown up. I miss the little, the little days. But, you know, you can enjoy the little days again. Go pick up a toy. Re-gift your resources. Pick up something and bless someone else. Or how about the Lottie Moon Christmas offering for foreign missions? Can you give? Yeah. Can you give more this year? How about, could, could you consider buying one less gift for you or your family, and invest in eternity, and invest in souls, would you do that? How about Mount Pisgah Baptist Church? Maybe this is the place you want to invest. Maybe you believe in what God's doing here for the future, and you want to give. Or maybe you just know somebody in need. Maybe you just know a neighbor who just needs you. 
maybe needs you to go rake leaves off our yard. That's investing your time and your resources. Are you willing to do that? Maybe you, too, have a room for someone who needs a place to stay. Well, that's radical. It also could be called foster care. Just think about those things. Are you willing to re-gift what God's given you? There are more. There's so much more. Maybe God has placed something on your heart today that I've not even brought up. And, and you're like, man, uh, listen, whatever he has done, whatever he has placed on your heart, go do it. Go gift that. Follow the example of that one person. That one person in this passage who said, you know what, I don't have a room. I don't have a bed. But I've got a stable. And I've got some hay. And you know what, I even got a little trough that you can use for a crib. And I can give you that. What you willing to give? What are you willing to re-give? One final verse. 1 John 3, 17. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Are you willing? Be willing. Be willing for God to use you. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. You see... This message is not possible without the birth of Jesus. And you're not here without Jesus coming and dying on a cross for your sin. You see, that happened that day. Not just to give us an example of how to live, but it happened that day mainly because God was sending His Son. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wait a minute. Wait. God did what? He gave. He was generous. By the way, he was more than generous. He gave. Will you receive that gift today? If you're here and you've never by faith trusted the Lord Jesus, you've never given him your life, will you trust him today? Will you give him your life? And maybe something I said today, maybe you're thinking, you know what? There's somebody. There's something on my heart I need to go do. Will you write, take time, write that down. Remind yourself, man, I need to go do this. God's calling me to go bless someone in a special way. To give in a different way. Would you do that? Every head bowed and every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here and you never by faith trusted the Lord Jesus, and you want to give Him your life, I want to be able to pray for you. Say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus today. Would you pray for me? You just lift up your hand. I just want to be able to pray for you. Anybody here, you saying you don't know Jesus. Father, I want to thank you so much for this opportunity to come, to be here. God, teach us, Lord, to give, to give generously, to live that kind of life. Open our eyes and our minds to those you want us to impact through the resources you've given us. God, have your way in this time. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand? If you're lost today, we encourage you, leave your seat, leave your sin, come to Jesus. If you're looking for a church home, you feel like this is the place you want to be, just come down here and let us know. Let me know so that we can announce to the church that you'd like to be a part of this body. And maybe you just need to pray or you need somebody to pray with you. Why don't you come so that we can pray for you and encourage you today. God bless you as we sing. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. Oh,
God bless you guys. Y'all are so wonderful. Looking forward. How many is looking forward to a great Christmas season? Spending time with family and worshiping the Lord. I want to ask you this question before um, I ask Marshall to, to pray and dismiss. How many of you just love sitting around and singing Christmas songs? Raise your hand real high if you love doing that. Oh, great, great. I want to invite you to come out tonight at 6 o'clock, and we're going to sit around and sing some Christmas songs together. So everybody, raise your, raise your hand again. You're coming tonight. Amen. Come on out tonight, 6 o'clock, and we're going to sit around. We're just going to sing some Christmas songs and, and uh, take a look at God's Word. I know originally we didn't have it planned for a service tonight. But man, come on out. And we're, I decided, I, I, today I was just thinking, I just want to sing some Christmas songs. So y'all come on out. Let's sing some Christmas carols together and, and, and enjoy some time together singing. And I'll share a little bit from God's Word, and, and we'll have a good time. Marshall, why don't you, you got choir practice at? Choir practice, 430. Yes, and you pray for yes, us. Yes, sir. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much that you, uh, you've given us, um, us our salvation to give. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to be challenged to do that. Lord, you've given us our financial resources to give and to, to lift others up. And Lord, I pray that you would just use this season to help us celebrate that and, and to make it a way of life for us. And we thank you for it. In your name we pray. Amen.